Uh, I'd like to share some things uh, that are uh, not necessarily easy to comprehend, uh, but once you see them, then they're not as complicated as they were before you look. You couldn't see them. So, a uh, passage of scripture. If you want to find this place, you can. Uh, First Thessalonians chapter five. It's in the and there. You want a Bible? Yes. Could you hand her a Bible? Good. If you want to look in your index, and that's the easiest way, so otherwise you can fumble through all the books back and forth. It's, it's, not, it's not wrong to turn to the index and find out what page it's on. You know what I'm saying? Just uh, find that. First Thessalonians chapter 5. And uh, this is a uh, fairly popular passage of Scripture, so I think most of you have heard it. And I uh, wanted to just pick on this passage of Scripture and point out some things. Okay, when we, uh, when we uh, approach the concept of God, generally we have been taught, and, and this, is, this is a correct teaching, that God is a triune source. Right? That God is a trinity. Even though that gets very complicated. I, I can remember, you know, as a very young, quote, Christian in my middle, late 20s, 26, 27, and they were trying to explain to me this concept of the Trinity, and I, I, well, that was new to me, I, I, and I couldn't, I couldn't grasp that. How could three be in one, and how could one be three? You know, that was really, and of course they would say, well, it's sort of like, water, ice, and vapor. And it give me all of these different analogies to try to simplify it. But it still never would simplify it because, you know, and then, uh, then they would say, well, you have to ask Jesus to come into you. And so I'm thinking, well, this, now wait just a minute. How is another person going to come into my person? Because I'm in my person. And how some someone else going to get inside here with me. So that was that was very complicated for me to start with. As a matter of fact, I'm not sure if I ever figured that out. <laughs> All right, I'm still working on it. I could put it like that. But the idea of Trinity is the foundation of everything that is. And so I want to talk about that idea of Trinity, of what is a Trinity. And of course, I keep this on the board. I've done this now for the last several weeks months I think I have kept this on the board because and the reason I do these are the first nine characters in the Hebrew alphabet like for instance you have in the Hebrew alphabet you have uh, a counting method that's used from the alphabet so the alphabet is the numeric system there's not a separate numeric system from the alphabet in Hebrew. It's all the same. Now that's that's kind of contradictory in our way of thinking because you know we we have separate a numeric system in English and an alphabetical system in English and they don't they don't mesh together. But in Hebrew they're they're one in the self same. And so that is a little complicated up front. But the first nine glyphs which are single characters in other words, they're just, by, by that I just simply mean there's just one character, one, 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 one. But then when I start with the next row, if it's 10, 11, 12, there's two characters in English. Then when I get to 100, there's three characters in English. It's, that's not it's not that way in Hebrew. And so that, that kindly is hard or difficult to grasp until you kind of see it. And once you start to see through it, then you see the actually the simplicity in it. It, it, it becomes simple, but you have to get the picture. Mm -hmm. 
So these first nine characters, I'm calling characters. In Hebrew, they're called glyphs, and the word glyph actually means holy character. And these characters are supposed to be designed by the sun reflecting itself on the earth. So that's so that's how they were concocted <laughs> or, or put together. And other other languages, our English is English and Greek, kind of complement that you know in different ways you know like in english we have for alif we have a for beth we have b so, so you can kind of see that but they're not they don't all sound the same sounds are not exactly the same at all they kind of change but that's kind of how they go so the reason i have these characters up here is because in these characters is the entire whole manifestation of everything that's on the earth. That's a lot. That really is a lot. You think about it. So the Alif, that's the first character. That's the first glyph that's in the Hebrew alphabet. And that is a sign or a symbol. That's what that character is. It's called, it's called the ox. Some, some call it an ox because this is his head and his back and his rear hind quarter, his tail and his front leg. So they kind of, you know, <laughs> doesn't look like an ox to me, but that, they call it that because it's powerful. And that's what it represents. It represents God as being all-powerful, creator, etc. So it's just a symbol. That's all it is. It's a sign. It's not saying because God or source, or whatever you'd like to call it, is not definable. You can't define it. Because, and I, I'm going to tell you why you can't. Because it is everything, and it's nothing. It's everywhere, and nowhere. Now, that, that's difficult on the mind, isn't it? Because you hear what both of those are? They're, they're paradigms. They're contradictions. They're paradoxes. How can it be everything and nothing? How can it be everywhere and nowhere? Because it is. <laughs> right? And so that, that, so that complicates trying to put your brain around it, trying to say, well, how am I going to possibly? Well, if, if we can take God out of this human body that we put God in and realize the only human body that God is in is ours, our bodies. God created our bodies for its home, its dwelling place. So where God lives is in us. And that's not to say that God's not out there everywhere because God is. And I use this analogy, this illustration. There are words that are changed and redefined. And many times that brings a lot of confusion. Like y'all have probably never heard of the word Eparanus or Oranus. You probably have never heard of that. Well, that actually is a Greek word that means the sky. Mm -hmm. It means the sky. So if you go out at night and you look into the sky, what would you call that? Right. Right. Most of the time, you'll call it space because it's just a great big black nothing with a lot of dots in it. That's called the sky. That's Oranus. And the word actually means up there. But you know how that word got translated? The word heaven. And that's not what heaven is. For instance, if you go into the Old Testament and you want to look up the word sky, you'd have to look up the word ruach. And yet that word ruach in Hebrew got translated for the word spirit. Because the word spirit just simply means breath. It's not seen, but it's everywhere. So you see, you have these two, and, it, and that word never did get translated for the word heaven in, in Hebrew. The word heaven in Hebrew is shamayim, and actually it means waters above and waters below. And it, 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 is, it, it really is a designation to the physical body. Mm -hmm. So the Hebrew word heaven is a designation to the physical body, yet as we've been taught because words change, we have been inundated with the idea is heaven is somewhere I'm going to get to go to one day. So I live my life wanting to go to this place 
that's not real, that don't even exist. Mm -hmm. But I live my life thinking I'm going to get to go there one day. And I know when I say that, oh God, you're taking away everything that I've got. I'm really not. I'm trying to give you everything that you, you have and don't know you have. Because mm -hmm. you are heaven and you don't have to go somewhere to, buy, to find it. <laughs> you're it. Look in the mirror and you found heaven. Because you are the waters above and you are the waters below. It's the physical manifestation of God in the earth. That's heaven on earth. Heaven in earth. And so, since these words change, and you can look up these words if you want to. I can actually give you the Hebrew numbers <laughs> for either or Greek numbers to look these words up and see that's exactly what they mean. Like if you look up the word heaven, actually it means sky. Space. And there is nowhere space is not. And space is everywhere. Because when we see our physical body, when they look at our physical body through a high-powered microscope, they realize that the, the more they tune into it, between our cells is nothing. Space. <laughs> So really you could say between ourselves is God. Mm -hmm. Because space is God. Mm -hmm. It fills everything. And it's not contained by anything. Because mm -hmm. it just is. Yeah. So when your physical body, you lay it down, you didn't lay down space. Space mm -hmm. just is. Mm -hmm. see, see? And I realize that's complicated. And, I, and so the first blip is, uh, is a symbol. It's called the Aleph. And it's a symbol for the term that we call God. Okay? Or we could call it power. Because that's what God is. Right? God is all powerful. God is all filled with power. So we can, you know, we can look at it that way. And then the last glyph, and the reason I'm doing it this way is because these seven glyphs in the middle, the two through the eight, these seven glyphs, are a key to so many things that once we start to see that, we can, wow. The first blip, if you can, if you can just kind of tuck that away and realize the first one is a sign, a symbol that represents God or all power. The last blip, the ta'at, is a symbol that represents the feminine energy to produce all that power can produce. And what it does, all that power can produce goes to the divine feminine and takes these seven glyphs to make it, to manifest it. And these seven glyphs represent you. These are the seven endocrine glands. These are the seven major building blocks of the physical body. These, this number seven will be a key number. You'll see it all the way through Scripture, no matter where you go. Okay? So if you found this passage, 1 Thessalonians, we we'll look at that. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And, uh, and this will get... I, I know this will be challenging to some of the things that we have thought because we've been taught to think the way we think. And I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but I am saying I probably would challenge some of that. And maybe sometimes if you're trying to think of, of an idea you had not thought of, it's a little bit trying to do that, right? But once you kind of start to do that, it works out okay. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. It says, And the very God of peace sanctify you holy. W-H-O-L-L-Y. Now the word holy, actually in the Greek, it means complete to the end. Set you aside or make, set you apart Complete to the end. So it wants to sanctify you wholly. And your whole, now watch this next phrase, your whole spirit, soul, and body. Now watch this. Look, at, look up here at me. This is, this is spirit. Okay. This is spirit. This is soul. And this is the body. Okay. So here's your trinity. You always come back to this three. You are the manifestation of the trinity. You're the manifestation of the Father, the Spirit, 
and the child. You are. You are. So the body actually becomes the material scene manifest of, of all three of these. The three in one. So that's why he's saying whole. He said, I want you to be complete and entire. Perfect. That's what that word means. I want you to be complete and entire perfect. Your whole spirit and soul and body. Be preserved blameless. Now, of course, they have that little phrase until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that's fine. I won't, I won't tamper with that. If you, if you can realize that the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is come. It's not going to. It is. Mm -hmm. It is. Though it's always present. Is is always present. It's now. Mm -hmm. So if you can put that in your thinking think box and just kind of think along with it. The whole reason that you are is for this right here. Is for the purpose of manifesting that which we call God. Now to do that is it's not simple. It's not easy. Like in ancient Hebrew, they call they call this uh, they call a, uh, a a pattern or a blueprint the tree of life, and that pattern or that blueprint is made up of of this. I'll draw it kind of small. This is what it looks like. It's. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. It's three mm -hmm. trinities. Okay? And this one, this bottom one, is the horizon or it's the earth. Okay? Because the earth is the place of manifestation. I mean, everything in nature is constantly showing you this all the time, mm -hmm. 365 days a year, all the time, winter, summer, spring, fall, it don't matter. It's constantly showing us this, and it's constantly showing you the contrast in manifestation. Mm -hmm. Manifest, manifestation doesn't happen without contrast. What is contrast? That's inhale, exhale. That's, that's your heart, the pulse of your heart. That's where it contracts and extracts, back and forth, back and forth. Doesn't work without that. Contrast, contrast can be called something else in Hebrew. And I'm going to look at that just a little bit and show you that and realize that's not right, that's not wrong. It's how the, the Trinity works. It's how it's designed to manifest. It's designed to, to do this, to be this. And so therefore, you'll have to look at your life maybe in a different light than you than you have before because your life is not a mistake. You haven't made a mistake. Your life is a manifestation. And it's the manifestation of the choices that you've made, not right, wrong, not good or bad. We're taught to look at those choices as good or bad, right or wrong. Right? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's just how we're taught to do that. And uh, again, that's not... If I, uh, if I look at the Trinity and I look at the Spirit, the Spirit, if I look at it and I realize it's power, but what is it all powerful for? You know, you, you think, well, it's all powerful just to work a miracle. You are a miracle. Just your being here is a miracle. Yeah. In many ways, you know, more than one way. Just to be here is a miracle. You are the manifestation of a miracle. You may not see yourself that way. So, you are this trinity, this spirit, soul, and body. You are this trinity. And the first thing that the trinity shows, we'd look at that if you want to. You can go with me next door, not far away. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The whole purpose of the Trinity is to manifest you. To bring you into existence. And so here you are. And so what you do with your existence, what you do with your manifestation, is not right or wrong or good or bad. It just simply is. And the beauty of this is you have the choice 
to do whatever you like to do with it. And that's not right or wrong. That's not good or bad. It just, it just simply is. Now, this gets very complex. Not necessarily complicated, but very complex. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 46. I want to look at this one verse. How be it? Everybody there? Mm -hmm. Verse 4. How be it? That was not first, which is spirit. You know, I, I, that sounded contradictory to me. I thought, that can't be right. What, but what does it say is first? How be it? That which is, that which is first is not spirit, but what? Natural. The natural is first. So then the body is that which is first. It's prioritized. Well, why is the body, the natural, prioritized as first? Because it's that which manifests spirit. Spirit is not manifest. Spirit's like, you know, when you look at Genesis 1, chapter 1, verse 2, it says, and the spirit begins to is the word ruach. It means the air or the breath. You can't see the air or the breath, but that if you, you have to have first a body, for air or breath to do anything. Mm -hmm. So if you don't first have a body, the air or breath is just continue to go on to be air or breath. Mm -hmm. And without a body, you go back to air or breath. Mm -hmm. So actually you can call breath or air the great no thingness. Why? Because it's not manifest. And until and or if it doesn't manifest. It's nothing. It's not anything. Oh, I, well, it's air. Big deal. This room is filled with air. I mean, the whole earth is filled with air. A lot of space out there is filled with air. But until it has a manifestation, until it has something, and this is the, the that's why it's called the Kabbalistic Tree of Life. It's three sets of trinities. Three and three. These three sets of trinities, the first three represent the divine picture, plan, idea. You can have all kinds of idea, but if you don't manifest it, what good is it? Tomorrow you forgot it. Mm -hmm. That's pretty when, Just you, a, when you said that uh, first the body has to be born, and then the air comes in, and that's when you become living. Yes, yes. I mean, that's true, it, and I'm not, I, and I, I completely agree. Is that body alive inside the womb of the mother? Yes, it's alive by the power of its mama, mm -hmm. but it's not manifested. It's still there, mm -hmm. still in the curtain, it's still in the incubator, it's still in the, uh, in the process of being. Mm -hmm. Then when it's pushed out, the air enters it. Now, now then you have mixture so now you have spirit, breath, air in a physical manifest body. Mm -hmm. That now is all powerful to be and do anything that it wants to be or do. And many times it will be and do the things it don't want to be and do because it doesn't channel it or direct it. It just says, oh well. Yeah. Y'all ever done that? Oh well. <laughs> no discipline, no direction. You know, I look at that a lot and I see the young people in today's society and I think, wow, here is a major issue. We have no discipline, no direction. It's just, oh well. Just play the game. Put a video, put something in front of them. No vision, no direction. No discipline. So see, when you see this Kabbalistic tree of life, that's what it's called. Kabbalist, it's called the Ten Sephirots. And inside these ten sephirots are connecting these ten sephirots like a, like a zigzag are 22 open spaces or channels. There are exactly 22 Hebrew glyphs in the Hebrew alphabet. So inside these ten sephirots, potentialities, are the 22 Hebrew glyphs. And when you add 10 and 22, you come up with the number 32, and you'll find 32, like in masonry, 
especially in Kabbalah masonry, has 32 degrees or 32 steps or 32 functions to get you from the earth to the crown. That's exactly the same thing true with you. You have all of this here. That's your part. Your part's to do the work. <laughs> it's God's part to manifest. God will manifest all the work you do. Whether you like it or you don't like it. Because much of the work that I've done that manifested, I didn't like it. <laughs> but I'm the one that did it. I'm the one that put it together. I mean, you know, I'm the one, you know, you create the power of life and death is where? In the tongue. In the tongue. Mm -hmm. You create by the words. What are the words? They are the seeds that you sow mm -hmm. that bring the crops that you manifest. Mm -hmm. Ah, well, I don't like that. You know why? We are lazy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, mean, no, not, I am lazy and and generally don't like discipline. You know, don't tell me no. I bless God. I'm don't just don't tell me no. I <laughs> but you know there should a lot of times no is a good thing. It's a good restraint. No. Mm -hmm. you know, sometimes yeah, yeah, exactly. A river is not a river without banks. Yeah. Banks are boundaries. Mm -hmm. The stronger the river, the more solid the bank the more powerful the river can be. Now that's true with us. That's why in this Sephirotic tree of life, this tree of life, it has boundaries. It has these banks. And it has the, all of it. The potential is not just to be manifested and planted in the earth. I mean, you're here. Mm -hmm. My God, there's nearly 8 billion of us here. Now, the key of being here is to get to there. Mm -hmm. To the crown. To that place where I'm in charge, so where I am holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y. When I am W-H-O-L-L-Y, then I become H-O-L-Y. That's my potential. To be whole, W-H-O-L-E, complete, not, not just parts of me working, but the whole thing, I want all of it work. So that the body, so verse 46, how be it that was not first which is spiritual, that which is natural, and then afterwards, mm -hmm. spirit. So it's after I'm born, now that I have the work to do. I have the development. I have the cultivation. I live in this contrast, and if I don't know what to do with this contrast, mm -hmm. then the contrast will just take me over. Mm -hmm. It's just exactly like the weeds that grow in the field, the weeds that grow in wood. Without the work, those things will just grow and take over everything in life. And that's not right or wrong. They're just designed to grow there. They grow there or they grow here. And many times we don't, we don't pay any attention to it. We just don't know. So the spirit is the power. The, the teot is the manifestation the soul is that energy that's given to us for that purpose. And the body, I mean, the body is the manifestation. And the soul is given to us to link those together. <laughs> so that that which, that which can be, will be. Right? So you, you can follow. Now, there are so many <laughs> examples of what I'm saying to you in scriptures. And the, the reason that I try to do what I try to do is to show you that the scripture is a compilation of stories. Not right stories, not wrong stories, not good stories, not bad stories, but just stories that show the contradictions in everything that is. You know, it's like someone, I was telling someone, I can't remember, we were talking about the characters in the Old Testament. I said there are story characters and stories that show all different things that happen in living life. All kinds of, uh, you know, I think I used this, maybe I used this story last week, and I said, if you believe this story to be literal and real, you're thinking with the five-year-old brain. You remember that story? It was the story of this guy with the jawbone of an ass. 
Y'all remember that, Samson? And I said, do you really think that he killed a thousand of those, those trained warriors? Somewhere he just found uh, a jawbone. He found that jawbone of that donkey laying around. And he said, come on, boys, I'll take all of you. <laughs> now, I like, I, I like drama. I, I like uh, suspense. You know, I like uh, shoot them up, bang, bang, cut their head off, poke their eyeballs out movies. I, I admit that. <laughs> I mean, John Wick is one of my favorites. <laughs> But I don't recommend any of y'all even go watch a John Wick, Wick movie. He kills more people in one movie than I think they must pattern him after Samson. He's got to be Samson's big brother. Has to be. Because he got guns that don't ever run out of bullets. <laughs> John Wayne. <Dwayne. laughs> no, that's a story, folks. That's not a literal, real event. You know, it's like going back into the Old Testament and looking at these stories, and if you can ever, it kind of at least entertain the idea, wow, they're fabulous stories. Now, what's in that story for me? Mm -hmm. what, can I get, what can I gain from that? How can I become a Samson? And when I have a thousand enemies coming against me, what can I do to conquer these thousand enemies? Because have you ever had a thousand ideas come at you in one day and just try to overwhelm you and take you down? I have constantly. Well, those thousand ideas that you have could have been the thousand uh, warriors that Samson was conquering, was going after. If we can look at the stories and realize in that light, the story makes sense. Mm -hmm. But if I look at it where it's a literal man fighting a thousand men in an army and say he's going out here with the jawbone of an ass and he's going to whip all of these guys, he's going to kill them, it ain't going to happen. <laughs> Sorry to bust you both. And so when you come back and you start to look at these stories and you go back to realize, wait, well, these are fabulous stories telling fabulous tales. And it's hard to get out of the first 12 chapters of Genesis trying to put those stories that are there in, in a literal, historical setting and make sense because they don't. For snakes don't talk. And if an apple tree was going to destroy your life, then why is apples good for you? I mean, God, if they're going to cause all that much damage, don't ever eat an apple again. <laughs> and the doctor's going to tell you just the opposite. What's the doctor going to tell you about an apple a day? You eat the doctor. Doctor. <laughs> you might not be the doctor telling you that. <laughs> it might not be. <laughs> but there are no talking snakes. So Genesis chapter 2 and 3, Genesis 1 through 12, those 12 chapters are the most twisted stories in Scripture. And I, and I said twisted stories. They are phenomenal stories when you begin to see the power in those stories. They are phenomenal. And you'll realize that you are the central theme of all of those stories no matter what the characters' names are. No, it doesn't matter which character you want to go back and look at in those first 12 chapters if you realize every one of those characters is representing some aspect of you. I don't care if it's the character of Adam, that word Adam, Alif Dalit Mil, actually means the manifest human race. It's not a guy's name in the story. The guy's name in the story is Esh, which comes from the root word Ish, which means fire. And so then Esh actually becomes the power or the spirit or the male aspect. When you're talking about male, I'm not just talking about a man. I'm talking about a seed. Because it's a male that produces a seed and a word is a seed and it's the most powerful seed you got. That's why you live your life. You're eating your words. You're, I mean, you know, I mean, we just go all through Scripture like a domino effect and I can show you everything I'm trying to say to realize that the Word is the seed. It's the male. It's the spirit. Mm -hmm. It's the, the Word is where the power is at. Right. It's what you say. You know, it's important. It's very important. Mm -hmm. You can say the right thing at the wrong time. Mm -hmm. 
Oh God, can I get you in a lot of trouble? Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, ask me a lot. You know, bless God, I know what I'm saying is right. But it's the time right. No, it's trying to plant seeds in winter. Mm -hmm. They don't grow. Right. You've got, you know, it's like uh, mm -hmm. the Tao Te Ching says, you have to learn to choose your battles. Because mm -hmm. if you don't choose your battles wisely, you're going to be trying to fight a summertime battle in the winter. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to tell you, you'll lose every time, mm -hmm. even though you're right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So I, so one of the keys of what I'm trying to say or what I am saying is contrast. And when I'm talking about contrast, I'm talking about when you look at Scripture and you see east or eastward, east always is referring to sunrise. It simply means light is coming forth. And when you see lights coming forth, that's the masculine. It's, that's the seed. The sun is sowing the rays, the seeds, to grow everything on this earth. And then when you see the sun set, then you see night coming in. It's the feminine time to incubate and take that seed that's been sowed and grow it. That's why a lot of times you can go out in the, in the field at night when the moon is bright and you can hear the crop grow. You can hear it. You can hear that moon pulling it up out of the earth. That's the contrast. So, and they're not, they're, you realize that if I'm going back to Genesis chapter 2 and I'm talking about the tree of Ra and Tov, I'm using Hebrew words, I'm talking about the tree of the sunrise, that's male, and the tree of the sunset, that's female, to manifest the seeds that the sun rays sowed. And you know what we call that? You know what we translate that? Good and evil. <laughs> and wow. So what if we so now then we took the contrast that's made and given to us for a manifestation to bring forth to materialize. We've taken that and we have debunked it. We have neutered it. We have made it not all powerful. We've made it powerless. Why? Because now we look at oh it's good or evil. Oh, it's the devil. There is no devil in Genesis 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. There is no devil there. Say, oh, but Brother Lynn, there's the serpent. The word serpent in Hebrew is nachesh, and actually it's the manifestation of the soul in the body. It's that which gives it intuition. It's that which gives it imagination. So the serpent that's sweeping up the tree is that which gives the thing the ability to imagine a thing, to intuit a thing. That's not wrong. It says, that's when it says, oh, now you've become like God. Oh, you, you really, is that a bad thing? <laughs> oh, yeah, we got to kill them all now. They're like us. we got to kill them. They're like God. So let's destroy them. Let's wipe out the whole human race. They turned out like us. <laughs> I thought that was the plan. <laughs> Wow, you see, we have these words that aren't properly translated in the stories. And when you get them words properly translated in the story, you're like, whoa, that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of a hee-haw. There used to be a, the two characters on hee-haw. One of them is a barber. He's sitting there, and I think it's uh, the other one. He's sitting there getting his hair cut, and they're dialoguing back and, and, back and forth. And one's telling the barber that his wife did this, and he said, oh, that's a good thing. He said, oh, no, that's a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> and they go back and forth, well, the good thing was a bad thing. Oh, the bad thing, oh, that's a good thing. <laughs> and so we start to see that, wow, that's how it works. Mm -hmm. So now that it gives me the choice that I can choose which one of them that I want. Yeah. Which, do I, which do I want to eat? Which apple do I want to eat right here? You know, I've got yellow ones and red ones. <laughs> So I get to choose. So the stories then, if we can take the stories and take them out of the idea that they are a history, that they are a, a literal thing that happened to all these people and, and God only had just this one special group. Now, 
I, you know, I, I sometimes I get kind of irate at parents who have special children and other children that they don't even know why they got them. Because I don't have any special children. I have three and they're phenomenal. All three of them are unique in their own different ways and I love them all. I have ten grandkids and I don't have a special one. They're all ten unique. They're all ten marvelous in their own ways. But I don't have a special one. You know why? I have all of them special. But oh, but God had just a special people. So God plays favors. Bull, why would you want to serve a God that you're second rate? You know, you're just a snotty no step kid. What are you even doing at the house? You're not even supposed to be in here tonight. <laughs> it ain't summertime. <laughs> Who called you? You know, when we have this kind of an ideology, and we do, it's flying real deep down under, and I'm kind of stirring around. But you see it, you begin to see you are God's chosen vessel. Mm -hmm. You're not some second-rate stepchild, no matter what the color of your skin or the texture of your hair or where you live mm -hmm. or even what religion you have embraced and said, wow, this is my religion. That's just your idea. God still embraces you. God still loves you. And it's my understanding of it. God loves you so much, He'll go with you to the very end. And I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. You can't do anything to get rid of me. <laughs> now that's a phenomenal God right there. That is a God that's filled with love and forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? That ain't the God that I thought was off the Old Testament God. He was an angry God. He's keeping a list, checking it twice. And you know, in Christianity, we still have that God sitting up on a big throne out yonder in this concocted place called heaven with a great big book with your name in it. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> he got all your record written down in there. Uh-oh. Mm -hmm. Tain't true? It's all concocted stuff to put you in a position to where you feel, woe is me. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I'm just a lowly sinner. I'm nothing. Mm -hmm. None of that is true. <laughs> you are everything. You are all that God intended you to be. Now what we are doing with it and manifesting it, that's a different story. But whatever it is, it's, it's your story. And that's not a bad story, that's not a, a wrong story, it's just, it just is your story. Let, go back with me to, uh, to Genesis, uh, Genesis chapter 2, I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 4, and I want you to see this with me in the names of these characters. I want you to follow me, follow me in these names of these characters in these stories. Uh, and, and it's not an accident that these names are the way they are. Because these names in, in their symbolic form represent aspects of you. And so therefore you can start to look at what they do and realize those are aspects of my very being. They are, they are aspects of who I am. So in Genesis chapter, chapter 4, we have the manifestation of Esh and Esha. Now you were told that that's Adam and Eve. But it's not. It's actually the manifestation of Esh and Asha, which are the names the Hebrew names of the word man and woman in Genesis 2 and 3. So the word man and woman in Gen are the word uh, husband and wife are those two words, Esh and Asher. They're not the words Adam and Eve. The word Adam is the word for the entire human race. That's the word Adif David Mim, Adam. And it means the human race. Doesn't matter if you're male or female, doesn't matter what culture where you come from, you're Adam. And he tells you that in, in chapter 5. He tells you that ver verse, real quick, look at it. Chapter 5, verse 1. You're right there next door. Chapter 5, verse 1. These are the books of the generations of Adam. I can say the generations of the human race. In the day that God created, that word man is Adam. In the days that God created the human race. In the likeness of God made he the human race. Male and female created he them and blessed them and called no. their name Adam. No. Called them the human race. Not Adam and Eve, he called them the human race. 
Because everybody has been told this story that Eve is the one that messed up and Eve is the one that got cursed and Eve is the one that is uh, that, that's bearing the brunt or action. I'm not, that's wrong. That Eve is the one that's birthing all this corruption on all of us. It's, it's her fault. And so therefore, I'm conceived in sin why? Because she brought the entire human race tumbling down with her. That's ridiculous. And it's not true. <laughs> and it is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Eve is only used twice in the Old Testament. You'd think if she's that important to be used. The word Eve is the Hebrew word Ha'eva and actually just simply means the mother of living. So, it, it, if I, I'm an Eve, I, I, I am I, the mother side of me, the feminine side of me, that took the seed that the male side of me gave me and incubated and produced it through me as life. Which is, which is an important concept and idea if I can begin to, if I can incubate it, if I can muse and I can think about it. Because... Well, I'll show you what I mean by that in just a minute. So you see, male and female created he them, blessed them, and called their name the human race. So Adam is not the name of a man that didn't step up to the plate and tell his wife, hey, don't listen to that snake. That, that's, that's a story that's not real. It's a story that's not true. It's a story that everybody believes. It's amazing to me how we do that. Mm -hmm. But I realize the complication in it. The complication is in the, the lack of translating words accurately. Mm -hmm. And when you start to see the accuracy of those words mm -hmm. translated, you begin to realize, wow, there's nothing wrong here. Really, there is nothing wrong here. What what's, seems to be contradictory here is what mm -hmm. I have produced in my life. And maybe what I have produced in my life really don't serve me for my greater good. So then it's up to me to start to change that manifestation so that it does serve me for my greater good. Because you see, you're put here. Now, hold, put this in, in your pipe. You know, write it down. You are sent here. You are put here to live your greatest life now. That's why you're here. If you're not living your greatest life now, then you and I need to look into the mirror and say, why am I not living my greatest life? It's not because I'm powerless. It's not because I don't have the potential. Because I have all of those things. Why? Because I have the power, the Spirit in me to do the work. To do all that I long to be done. So, spirit, soul, and body is represented by generally the three sons. Starts out in chapter 4 as Cain, Abel. Well, let's just read it. Verse, chapter 4, verse 1. And Adam knew his wife Eve. And she conceived and bare Cain. Now that word Cain, actually his word in Hebrew, when you look at the code, you begin to see what the word in the the things around it where it means the physical manifest. What's first? That which is first is what? Natural. So Cain represents the natural manifestation. Okay. And then his brother Abel represents the soul. He represents the feminine aspect of that, the soulish aspect. And then if you come to the end of the chapter, verse 25, it says, And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son and called his name Seth. Seth represents the spirit. You must say, well, how do you get that? I, you see, the reason I come up with this whole pattern, of, and there's three, spirit, soul, and body, is the last one is spirit, which where does the body manifestation come from first? It has to come from the Spirit, the unseen, the unknown. And so when you go into chapter 5, what you do is you do not even talk about Cain and Abel any longer. What do you talk about? You talk about Seth. So now you talk about the Spirit, and what does the Spirit do? 
It shows seven generations, just exactly like the seven days of Genesis chapter 1 and 2, because these seven are the ingredients for the manifestation again. So you have seven generations, and then when you come down to the end of chapter uh, 5, verse 28, it says, And Lamech, who was the seventh, lived a hundred eighty and two years, and begat a son, and called his name Noah. Now Noah, his name means the abundance of grace. So I want you to get the picture of all that's happening here with spirit, soul, and body. Everything that you see in the material world that's manifest is manifest by mm -hmm. the power of grace. Can you hear that? It is by the power of grace. It's the grace of God that produced every bit of it. You didn't do any of it. You didn't do any of it at all. It's the grace of God. And it's the grace of God that sustains it. It's the grace of God that manifests it. It's the grace of God that will keep it. So then Noah and his, and, and you see the thing about Noah is that we, we think, well Noah was, he was perfect. No, it's the grace of God that was perfect. Because if you look with me, let me just show you a little something here about Noah. Uh, if you look at chapter 9, now this is, this is, oh, oh Noah, same guy, done took a big boat ride. <laughs> And the ark, matter of fact, the ark is the, the physical body. The picture of the ark is the physical body because it's the physical body where God put the, the, co the commandment. The, the, does it not tell you in the book of Hebrews where are the commandments written? In the tablet of your heart. Not on tablets of stone. It makes that very clear. It's not tablets of stone, it's the tablets of your heart. And that, here's, here's your ten stones, right? Here's your ten sephirots. Here's your ten commandments. Here's your ten steps. But look here at, at Noah. I want you to see. His name means abundance of grace. Chapter 9, verse 20. It says, Noah began, and this is after the, the boat, the big boat ride. Everything is okay. And Noah, and Noah began to be a husbandman, and he planted a vineyard. Oh, first, uh, first thing he does. Watch what he does. First thing. And he drank the wine and he got drunk. Wow. The grace of God don't leave you when you get drunk on the wine of your creation. Isn't that wonderful? And after you have manifest the things that you manifested from your drunkenness of your creation, the grace of God does not leave you. It doesn't live from you. You know, the whole ideology right here of what happened was that Noah had a sexual encounter with one of his sons. That's the idea behind that. And because of that sexual encounter he had with the son, then God says, because you've done this, I'm going to curse you. Are y'all familiar with this story? It's just right here. The translation of the story is not right. It's incorrect. Because God says, what I'm going to do, because in the physical body, the material body, which the son that he's talking about here, that was Ham, and Ham represents the physical body. Again, we've got three boys. Ham represents the physical body. Japheth represents the soul. And Shem represents the spirit. Again, you have three boys. This is not a coincidence. This is all put here on purpose to tell you a story over and over so you can get the idea. We've been 1,700 years and lost the idea because of Catholicism and because of religion. Because we forgot that it's a, it's a phenomenal story showing me how I work. You see, the grace of God never lifts from you even if you're in a state of drunkenness. God ain't mad. <laughs> so, and God didn't get upset with anything or anybody. So, and, and when I say that, let me show you something about this story. Let's read this story a little bit further. Verse 21. And he drank the wine, was drunk, and he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers, and Shem and Japheth took a garment and 
and laid it upon their shoulders and went backwards. See, these two boys didn't want to see the daddy in their nakedness, but Ham's already been in there with his daddy naked. Hello. So he said, I can't see the right on Well, it don't matter to me. His brothers, Shem and Ham, Shem and Japheth, they walk in there backwards. They went backwards and they covered the nakedness of their father and, the faces, and their faces were backward and they saw not their father's naked. They didn't see anything. They weren't moved. Verse 24, And Noah awoke from his wine and he knew what his younger son had done to him. I wonder what that was. Use your own mind. And he said, look what he said, Cursed be Canaan. Now wait a minute. Who is Canaan? And how does he enter this story? Because every one of us have been taught and we sing the song, Canaan land my home in glory. Huh? Hello? <laughs> and here's where Canaan come from. Who is Canaan? Canaan is Noah's grandson through Ham. The flesh. The flesh produced a Canaan. So what is Canaan? Canaan is the land of milk and honey. Canaan is the land of contradiction. Canaan is the land where the sun rises and the sun sets. Canaan is the land that's cursed. But here's the problem. What is a curse? Because the second time this word is used in the book of Genesis. Cursed. Now I know what you've been told that a curse is and what that... Uh, I said I want you to remind me to read from this book more quick so I'm going to do it right now. Canaan. Canaan, the, here's what the name from the Hebrew means. It means realized nothingness. It means material existence. Hello, Cain. It means material existence. It means inferior. Canaan means lowland, that is, body consciousness. The redeemed body of the promised land, and when man rediscovers this lost domain, all the promises of scriptures will be fulfilled. What does that say? That's just simply saying that your body is the Canaan that that song tries to get you to look forward to out there in a heaven that don't exist. And if you realize this is Canaan land, but what is Canaan land? Canaan land is a land of contrast because it takes contrast. It takes the sun rising and it takes the sun setting for anything to grow and anything to be produced here. And you know what that contrast is called? Cursed. The word cursed just simply means contention, or you can call it, if you want to call it strife or stress, it is because it's the stress from the sun and its work and the setting of the sun and its laxing, releasing, or letting go. And that's called contrast, and contrast is a better word than curse. Because it's in contrast where everything that you live and move and have your being manifest and materialize. Mm -hmm. So, if you take those words and you just start to, because this word right here, cursed, in Hebrew actually is it's the word ar or. And the word just simply means contrast. It simply means, uh, the, you, you look at a child being built in, in the womb of a woman, it takes the contrast for that child to be built. You can look at your life. Your life is lived by the contrast that's in your life. Hunger, full. Mm -hmm. That's a curse. <laughs> I'm hungry. Yeah. I'm full. I got plenty. That's your curse right there. And you know, you'll lose it. Oh, but brother Lynn, I was told that the rose bushes didn't grow the grass until God said that. So now they pricked me and caused me to bleed. <laughs> No, the curse is the contrast. It's that tension between the sun rising and the sun setting. 
to do it all over again. It's that, and so you can see that tension creates the contrast, which is called a curse. And it's not anything bad about it. If you start, we start to look at it, and you start, wait a minute. If I want to change where I'm at, then I have to get myself in the contrast and work out. What does that mean, work out? Well, it means I'm going to have to exercise some discipline. Oh, no, now you're using words I don't like. <laughs> <laughs> now it means that you've got to take hold of those demons that flying over your head, i.e. thoughts, and quit building nests with them, and quit meditating on them, and quit thinking them, and get rid of them, cast them, oh, discipline, no. It's something that I see missing in a younger generation. Matter of fact, it's in, in a lot of us. And I look at my own life constantly, and I realize how lazy and lackadaisical I become. Because it's so easy just to be full, and then I'm not hungry rather than to find where is the middle way. Because it's where the middle way is, it's where I act, that's where happiness is at. That's where the peace and that, all that belongs to me. All that's mine. God wants to give that to me. Now I'm giving you a broad picture. I'm painting you a very broad picture of these stories, but to go back into the technical the technical writings of these stories, that's a whole different ballgame because when we get into these seven different sons that come from Seth and then we get into the sons that come from, from uh, and notice when you come to Genesis chapter 10 after, well let me back up, let me finish reading what I was there when the wine, when he woke from his wine, verse 24, he woke from his wine and he knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall be unto his brethren. The word servant is where we get the word slave. And the word slave is the same word for soma in Greek for body. Hmm. So what is a servant? A servant is your body which is designed to be your slave to serve you for your greater good. Or it take charge of you, and it'll, it'll reverse the scenario and put you in bondage of chains. <laughs> and that happens. Yeah, that happened. Canaan is be a servant of service and shall be unto his brethren. And it's a shame what they've done to these passages of Scripture. Well, and let's just read on. It says, And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant, and, and, shall, and uh, God shall enlarge Japheth. He shall dwell in tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. And you go down here, and you begin to look at those children. At verse 21, so you have three boys. You have uh, Ham, Japheth, and Shem, again, You've got spirit, soul, and body. Go back to Trinity. Everything is, I say that what I said to start out with, everything is because there's a Trinity. The three and the one. Everything is because of that right there. Spirit, soul, and body. Everything. No matter what it is. Spirit. You, and again, if you want to call it Father, Holy Spirit, and Child, I, it doesn't matter. You can call it Father, Mother, Offspring. It doesn't matter. That it, 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 everything works that way. Whether it's in the plant kingdom, animal kingdom, human kingdom, it don't matter. Any kingdom. Verse twenty-one and Shem. So this is the spirit. He represents the spirit. And lo and behold, he has seven <coughs> sons. And then the it goes into chapter eleven, and he lists in chapter eleven, verse ten. Mm -hmm. Verse 10 says, these are the generations of Shem. And then, lo and behold, you have seven more kids again. Here we go, back into seven. You follow what I'm saying? Are you getting this picture a little bit? It, you can't even imagine how many years it took me to go through this and, and try. And, and knowing something's here. I, I, I knew something is, something's here, and I'm just not getting it. And then when I started, I said, oh, God, it hit me like a ton of brick. Just about knocked me out of my chair. And I said, oh, Lord. You have the same story told three different times using different circumstances, situations, and even people's names, etc. All explaining something that's phenomenal. 
how manifestation works. So then again, you have Shem and you have his seven sons that come up to the manifestation of Abraham and Sarah. And then the whole Bible unfolds that whole picture. Just the most phenomenal, beautiful picture that you have ever seen as you see it. Everything that is natural, manifest, comes from that which is not. That is not manifest. In other words, the Spirit. So, Spirit is the all-powerful. And its present is all present to do and to be all that it can do and be. So, we'll just disconnect here and come.